welcome to another episode of the Firehouse Chronicles, a living history of a lifetime spent serving others as seen through the eyes of a veteran firefighter. This week we are featuring Mr. Leroy C. Harding. Leroy, welcome to our little talk. We have a, we've been doing these a few weeks now and have got some, some stories from some firefighters that have been around, seen a lot of things, and, and uh, you have an interesting story. You're a, you're a veteran firefighter, career firefighter, and then also have some wartime experience in World War II. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but we're welcoming you, welcome you to our program. We've been doing this a while and, and pretty excited about some of the things we're learning about how things looked at the firehouse, you know, prior to uh, some of the guys that are on now that have a, you know, a lot of good equipment and things like that. You guys were in a little different situation. So tell me a little bit about your time. Like when, give us a time frame. When were you a firefighter? 1948 to 1968. Okay. I was a driver, they made driver in 51 when they heard that the 12 black men. Mm -hmm. And that automatically put me into the driver's position. Okay. And uh, I had to. There was three of us, and we had to go to 18s and ride out until they got the opening. And we had a pretty good time with it all there together. Mm -hmm. They finally got it where they spread us out. Mm -hmm. I went to sixes. Ninth and Stonewall. <laughs> it was funny. I went to work the first day of January '68, and I was working for my dad in the tile business, and I laid the laid the, the asphalt floor in sixes, and two weeks later I moved in. <laughs> So, so the, t the tile job, you laid the asphalt underneath the tile? No, I laid the asphalt. Or the tile and everything. The, the tile and the asphalt. Okay, okay. And it's, and, it's, <laughs> and the first thing I met was the captain, and I, he was a very good friend of mine. His worked at old age, and, Extra, uh, oh, oh boy. the stockyards station. Exchange Avenue down there. I was wondering, you said Exchange. I wondered if that wasn't down yeah. by the old stockyards. Yeah. It is on the north side. The new new H is on the south side. Okay. Just a half a block down. So you were at the stockyard station, you think, in the 60s, late 60s, mid 60s? No, I was 40. Well, I don't remember how old it was. Well, you know, you, I guess I had that wrong. You quit in 68. You're retired. Yeah. So you'd been 40s. It'd been earlier than that. So you remember the old, you remember, which is an interesting perspective because you remember when the stockyards was called Packing Town. Yeah. And all the armor and all the different packing companies would actually, you know, process animals in there. Yeah. And you probably remember the old Stockyards Coliseum. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very well. Yeah. So that fire, that burned down. I, the reason I'm saying this is I was a, I was in Midwest City. I was born in 61. So I was about second grade or so. But my dad used to take me down to, to what we called packing town in those days. And they had championship wrestling at the at the Stockyards yeah. Coliseum. Went there every every Friday night. Cowboy Bill Watts and Danny Hodge yeah. and all those guys. Yeah. See, I'm not just some old kid, <laughs> but uh, so that fire. I don't remember what year. I know that some of the livestock guys around Oklahoma City, some of the traders and stuff, have got pictures. I know one guy for sure has a picture of the Oklahoma City Stockyards Coliseum on fire. But I don't remember what year it was. I don't know if that's important. I, 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 don't, I don't remember either. Yeah, but you might. That might have been before you got over that way. Well, uh, I, I was born in Packingtown. 
Really? 1102 South Pennsylvania. No kidding. Yeah, I'll I was a member of Exchange Avenue Baptist Church mm -hmm. for years and years really? and years. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that was a, I mean, it's, they're still trying to keep all that going, but it's interesting that it, you know, they struggled to kind of, because now it's just a sale. Excuse me, they just got the livestock sale. They really don't have any processing in there anymore. But I remember, I remember vividly as a little kid, my first cowboy hat came from Packingtown. I don't remember what store, but probably one of the stores, Teeners or Langston's or whatever was down there. It must have been Langston. Probably was, probably mm -hmm. was. But anyway, that's an interesting thing because a lot of people, younger people anyway, don't remember. They call it Stockyard City now. Yep. But now, you know, it was, it was packing town. You mm -hmm. were born down there. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah the house is still there. Really? It's flat roof. Huh. And I was born there in 1927. Wow. We've got a picture of my son's ex late wife. I mean, my late, my youngest son had a wife, well, live in for three years. Yeah, yeah. She took me, oh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. You to, got to go down there and see it? Huh? You got to go down there and see your old house? Yep. How about that? She, because I told her about it, and mm -hmm. she said, well, let's go, Pop. And so she oh. she was driving and went there, and she got to the front and the back. I, I always said that uh, I lived in the only flat-roofed house, and I guess you were, yes, ma'am, if I didn't go over there, and the house very next door is flat roof. <laughs> and just, your memory wasn't as, as good as you thought on that then. Well, well I even <laughs> was in the house. Sure. I, I knew the people real well. Right, I'll be. And the bathroom was on the back porch and mm. had a water, a gravity flow. Like a tank on the roof where they... Yeah. Wow. You talk about it, and, and the bathtub was a, a number three tub. You probably didn't take one every night just because you felt like it. No. Didn't want to waste no. that water if you're having to haul that water in, or I don't know how you got it. Did it was it like a catch, like not like a cistern, but a tank on the roof, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting history. I mean, that's probably a whole other <laughs> whole other interview, honestly. With you know, of course, I'm a agriculture guy. I was an agriculture teacher years and years ago, and and. Uh, that all that's a, that's stockyards history is pretty neat too there's there's a whole other piece of that story that you could yeah. probably talk all day on that but so you were a so you were a firefighter from 48 i think it said and i can't really read my writing 48 to 68 all in oklahoma city okay so equipment wise what does that i mean i know nowadays we've got a lot of a lot of good equipment thank goodness because these guys go into as you know go into some terrible situations and, and breathe who knows what and all that. What did it look like back in, like, say, 48 or 50? You know, you, you've you been through a lot, especially in an urban area. You'd probably go into some buildings and things yeah. like that. Well, like I say, I worked at six as my first place station, mm -hmm. and that's black. Back then, that was all black. Okay. And uh, I had... Uh, I made a grass fire and a uh, little black boy chunked a rock and hit me and chipped, chipped the bone in my... Really? I tried to catch him. I had a chain with a hook on it. At that time, uh, uh, if I'd have caught him, I'd have used it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet so. You get somebody uh, hit you with a rock. Well, it hurt. Oof. And the more harder I run, the harder it hurt. Mm. And if he finally got ducked out behind the houses, and I couldn't couldn't find him, and the lieutenant told me to get get my tail let, back. Let it go. Yeah, let it go. And, so that had been uh, so. So you mentioned something earlier that I, I thought may be interesting too. So you said at one point we were talking a little earlier. You said they hired some black men on the they fire hired, department. Yeah. 
was that a segregated situation back then? Because that's no. you know that's mm -hmm. uh, they was I mean there were other black firefighters or was that no. something? No, that was so they were the first ones. Yeah, yeah. and I think you maybe said fifty one. Huh? In 1951 or so, yeah, they hired those first. Yeah. You said maybe eight black men. Yeah. So that was that was a first. I mean, it's a it's a every day now. There's no. I mean, doesn't matter what color you are now. You're you're you oh, be a firefighter. Oh, almost all of those are dead. Really. And they all, everyone, I believe, every one of them made brass. I mean, made some some rank. Yeah. Yeah. So was that, so back in those days, and that's an, you know, never have thought about this from a firefighter perspective. Was that, a, uh, was that awkward? I mean, did you work at a station with those guys or, or some of those guys or? I work with two of them. Okay, and it, was that awkward at first or what that? No, no. It, they're just a worker beside you no, then, No, because I, like I say, I worked with my, my dad and they had a black man to work to them. And okay. As long as I can remember, yeah, I, I get along perfect. Right. It's, when, yeah. Hey, <laughs> we had this one, one black guy. I can't remember his name. He's no medic different. We had a fire alarm. <laughs> Uh, well, I won't ever forget it. Yeah. And uh, this guy, he didn't make the rig. He, he was still on the pot. And Johnny Lynn was the chief. <laughs> this is the best part. <laughs> he uh, come up there back after we got through for the fire. Well, he come up, Chief Lynn uh, come up. I want to know where, uh, I can't think of his name. Wherever who he was. Yeah. Yeah. He said, he said upstairs, and he said, well, tell him to come down here. I want to talk to him. <laughs> he, he said, where was you at on the fire? And he said, I was on the pot. <laughs> Chief Lynn says, that's no excuse. <laughs> yeah. Chief Flynn says it's important that you make the fire at least it halfway before you have your britches up. <laughs> but he said, you, you're no longer a fireman. Oh, he fired him? Oh. He, oh, wow. Yeah. He's, and, and James, no. Yeah, I thought that. He said, well, I, I can, you can't fire me because I was... And where God I was taken oh, back to the Lord of God to go in the bathroom. <laughs> and he said, the good Lord don't want this place that I do. <laughs> so you were excused. Firm hand, wasn't it? <laughs> That's funny. That, that was a funny thing. And oh, a couple of days earlier than that, I had... Uh, like to say there was two two blacks, mm -hmm. and uh, I had had one uh, one of them on the truck. I was on the truck, rode beside the truck. He was open air and all that stuff. Sure. So we went up Fonts Hill, and he had a, just a roof ladder. She, the lieutenant told to get a roof ladder and had it up and this Nelson, no, Nelson was on the engine. And he had the tall black guy. He climbed up and he froze <laughs> on a roof ladder. Oh boy, the, the height got him, scared him. Yeah, but you know our regular house, mm -hmm. the roof, it, it's just an, not real high. Right, right. And and he was real tall. He he was half of it was just a little bit taller than them. So we're not talking about a skyscraper, we're just talking about the roof of the house. Yeah. Ah, okay. And uh, I went uh, lieutenant told me to get get me down and I had to climb up around and hug him. <laughs> 
to get him turned loose here. He was just, he just froze. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an interesting, yeah. an interesting yeah. perspective. I mean, I wouldn't have, you know, nowadays we don't, uh, you know, we're taught not to see color necessarily or, but, I, but I'd, I'd say, you know, that in that time, the tensions, because that was probably pre-Vietnam, I'd say, probably some racial tension. I mean, probably, you know, oh, in those yeah, days. They're, they're deep, deep down, they, yeah. they, they wasn't, wasn't really welcome, I'll put it right, that way. That, and that's kind of where I was going with that, because when you mentioned that they had, I think, in, and I think you said the year was 51, when they hired the first black firefighters, you know, today it's not even a question. It doesn't matter, you know, but, but I'd say in those days there would have been, I just remember from my childhood, some of the racial tension that might have been there, and I could see there being some some issues in a firehouse. If, yeah. if a, a black man were hired on, you might have a little bit of a, in that generation, might have had a little acceptance problem. You well, know? It, it just so happened that they, they, we, we, we was all a good group. We, Worked we together well. Yeah, yeah. Once you kind of got, yeah. Well, they, 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 they was like we was. Sure. When we sure. went to work, we didn't know nothing. Right. Right. Well, Just I, green I, I knew some because I'd mm. be right behind the fire station at eight, sir. Right. right. The captain would tell me something. You know, so. You'd had some training. You'd been on mm. some runs. Yeah. Kind of had an idea of what was going on, and those guys come in just like anybody else. They start from zero, yeah. and they don't know anything. They got to learn along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And training back then probably wasn't as intense as it is now. I know now. Well, they, we had a training officer. Yeah. And and he was he was well well known for his ability. Mm -hmm. And well, I venture to say in a month's time, he had had all. I don't know whether it was eight or twelve. Anyhow, he mm -hmm. had them all run through the mill. So they all, sure enough, turned into fire. For most of them, yeah. except the one that got fired for staying on the pot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a well, great story. His, his he was replaced right, right quick. Yeah, uh, they had. Uh, I don't know. They they had. Uh, several names that they could pick from. So there was probably, it sounds like back in the 50, 50 era, 50s era, there was probably, did they have trouble getting people to be a firefighter? Or was there plenty of guys that needed a job and would? There, there was a lot of just like me, they needed a job. Sure, sure. Because I couldn't, couldn't work with my dad all the time because right. I couldn't get the kind of pay. So half, did you, back in those days, and again, I'm trying to feature the 50s and 60s maybe, did you guys work 24 on, 24 off? or yeah. So you, you might work with dad a little bit on the side maybe. Did you do some of that yeah. when you're on your off days? Yeah. A lot of guys do to kind of fill in the blanks. That's, that's kind of a There's normal. There's a lot of us in that yeah. back then. Yeah. I always used to say, of course, growing up, some couple of my best friends were firefighters as we became adults and I always used to say if you need you need a trade of some kind first place to ask is your firefighter buddies because somebody will be a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter or whatever because they all yeah. you know have a lot of that side yeah. trade stuff going on it's good you know it's good because I imagine back in those days the pay wasn't I mean it's, like you said it's better than you could get working for your dad but it probably wasn't high I mean no, you weren't getting no, rich no, it's just part-time it's, it's just like as if I was single. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why, uh, you know, I had always, when I got married, my father in law, then, up I had three father in laws. Okay. I've lost three wives. Oh, gosh. I lost all three of my boys. So, oh, wow. The cancer's taken most of them. Gee, what a lick. So, but it, mm. uh, I forgot where it was going there. See? We were talking about pay and, and back when you were working some for your dad and working part time and. Oh, well, uh, uh, dad in law, uh, woman, he was a, 
uh, Leonard Dixon council was a councilman, mm -hmm. and my father-in-law was his campaign manager. Okay. So you had a little tie in there, didn't you, with yeah. the city? Yeah. Yeah. So, huh. but he wanted me to be a policeman. Okay. And I said no, no way. Oh, no, I tell you, yeah. No, I wanted to be a fireman, and like I say, I really got lucky because mm -hmm. my first station, the captain was a captain that took care of me when I was growing up. Right. And back in the boxing ring, so. Really. I had it. Chief Paris was a book, uh, the instructor, but they had a shed back there where we'd take three, three or four boys, boys and have them boxing matches. Mm. So he, he continued it when we got to over there. He, but <laughs> he, he liked it. Yeah, yeah he, he liked it. Well, that's interesting. So that, yeah, that's a that's an interesting time to have been a firefighter, and, and uh, you know, it's it's one of those deals that everybody's perspective is different. And that's one reason we're doing this firehouse chronicles, uh, and and one reason we have a great setting with this firefighter museum to kind of do this in. But uh, but everybody's view, you know, their their experience was different. Everybody's got a little different twist on what they saw, what they did, what they learned you know, how they fought fire, how they approached it, leadership, all that stuff. So it's really, it's always interesting to hear guys from back in the day uh, and, and how they ex how their experience was. So you uh, you were not only, you, you had a military background too. Pr was that prior to your firefighting time? I guess it would be. Uh, you were a World War II veteran, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Tell us about that. What, uh, how did you, did you enlist or were you drafted or? I was drafted. I was in high school. Okay. And I, I'd done a little bit of everything, but uh, mainly I just sat around. Cause, <laughs> yeah. Because like I say, whatever that called the war was over. Right. But it. There's another name for it. You know? Yeah, we were we were trying to clean figure out what the cleanup effort after a war is because Leroy, being a World War II veteran and worked as a mechanic, had mechanic training and things like that, and kind of worked in the in the. And we we're trying to think of what the term is after a war, because you said you were there for two years after the war was over. Well, it, gathering I, equipment. Well, and, I went in in '45 and got out at '47. Yeah. So. Yeah. That uh, well, I spent the biggest part of my time in in Valenciennes, France. In I, France, so you you served I, in France. I landed in Hol I mean, when I went over, I was first in Germany. Okay. And I went there for just a short while, and they moved moved us whatever the bunch. They, they, when we come over on the boat, they put half half of them went one way, and the other half went the other way. Mm -hmm. So they split this up. Gotcha. So you, uh, so you, you got out, and you said in '48 or '47, you got yeah. out of World War II and got out of the army. So it wasn't long. '47, you went, you went, you didn't lay tile very long. You went to the firehouse pretty quick, didn't you? After that. Oh yeah. So you. Uh, you got home, it sounds like, working with your dad a little bit, and knew you had to have a little more. So, little you, to, to make a living, you had to, so you went to the firehouse then. And then after you retired, because you retired from the Oklahoma City Fire Department in 1968, if I understand. So you had, you weren't near done working, you had life after that too. So what'd that look like? What'd you, what was your job? Well, I was, end up being the truck foreman. But a uh, well, uh, dozer operator, uh, front end loader. Okay. And uh, when I made truck foreman, well, whenever the guys is running the front end and or running the dozer, the scraper. Okay. If they wanted to go in. Town and 
or go get something to eat, or you have to go to the bathroom or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd take their place to keep everything going. So, keep that machinery moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so we, you, you had some mechanical experience from the military. Very little. Uh, but they, they mostly we went just about all. Okay, maintenance kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then, so you were city of uh, city of Edmond. You said after you got out of the fire service, yeah, you went to work for city of Edmond and worked 21 and a half years there. So, had to still still had to keep going because you got to do something during the day, don't you? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, I enjoyed it. Right. It's it was was hard, especially in the winter time. Oh, I bet. Yeah, but it, like I say, it, 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 if anybody had to go out, I'd be one of them. Yep, you got to keep the roads open and ice storms yeah. and salting and whatever else you had to do and scraping and all well, that. So. We didn't use much salt. So it, uh, for some reason or other, it, we had sand. Yeah. And we didn't, we had used manual labor. To, you know, they done it with a shovel. Mm. You think that ain't something? Oh, yeah, I'd bet. I'd bet so. I'd bet so. Edmund has got a lot of hills. Mm -hmm. And you try to keep a truck uh, from just sliding, mm -hmm. you, you'd have to ride the brake. I had an experience when I was in the fire department, would, uh, I like the lost the fireman. Mm. The lieutenant was on vacation. His driver was sick, so that left me in charge. Mm. And the, 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 the first class fireman was driving and I had a fire of the children's Baptist kids up on 63rd mm -hmm. and we had a grass fire there and he was, Matthews and I was on, the, had the, the holes and uh, Ryan, I mean Raymond Osterman was uh, driving, mm -hmm. and he, we we was a 200 feet away from him, and we turned around, and there was flames going up over the engine, mm. and we run back there, and he was burnt. He didn't burn the brig, I swear I don't know how I missed it. But it didn't, did scorch it and took it to the hospital. And John Hansen, did, have you, did you know I him? I knew John. I did, yes, well, sir. John was, his dad was Leroy Hansen and worked with Will Rogers. Well, they took, took, uh, or, boy. Took Osterman to the uh, hospital, uh, the big one, Baptist. Baptist. They got a burn center, I'm sure. Yeah. Or did, I'm yeah. I, I guess they would. Well, he was in it, and uh, I was up there with him, and uh, they were hands and brought John in with him. John was at ABA, mm -hmm. and Osterman head was swelled out about that big. Mm -hmm. His ear, was, his head is swelled so much, his ears was just look, look Barely, like. Yeah. And that, John liked to fill the drawers. Never, oh it scared the living oh, poop out of me. And John never did ride the drive a rig. Oh. Only rig I know he ever drove, it was a fire rig, was when he drove that one up to New York City. 
Yeah. And of course, he's by himself. Mm. And that, that, I'll, I'll never forget that, that kid, he cried. Mm -hmm. John did. Scared him, didn't he? Yeah. Never seen anybody yeah, that burned that bad. Yeah, so yeah. this Osterman, did he live through it? Yep. Okay. He, he, Must have. You said you almost lost somebody, but burns are tough, man. I'm telling you, burns, it's a wonder. I mean, thank goodness for good bunker gear and everything, because it's a wonder we don't get more of them burned worse. That, it's bad. That That's the best burn center Yes, it sir. used to be. I, I don't know. I don't know either. I still think they've got a pretty good one. There's a lot of good ones around. We got, you know, just technology's advanced. Yeah. We know more about how to tend to them yeah. and all that than we used to. But boy, it's a, it's the number one. I mean, it's the number one thing is this the danger. You know, this is dang. You know, this is John was doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Coughed. Yeah. Yeah. Council on Firefighter Training. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's, yeah. Yep. Very well, familiar I'm with coughed. I was with uh, Edmund. Mm -hmm. Well, after I retired, uh, I organized uh, a pay deal. Okay. Got it started from, anyhow, I ended up being president. Right. For 15 years. Okay. And he come out to our meeting and gives, of course I knew who was. Uh, sure, you'd known him since he's a yeah, kid. Yeah. And, hmm. and he, he passed out these. Oh, uh, that was, hmm. boy, that. Well, we have, uh, we have been here today with, again, uh, Leroy C. Harding, uh, veteran firefighter of the Oklahoma City Fire Department, uh, also a war t World War II veteran. Uh, kind of got a little, uh, little captured a few of the, the highlights of his time serving our country as one of the greatest generation, as we call World War II veterans. So uh, we've, we, we appreciate Leroy, first of all, your service to our country. Appreciate that very much, and that's something we don't say enough in America, I think and also appreciate your public service and your services on the fire service and and uh, and, the, and the, the trail you blazed with a lot of other firefighters back in the day when things weren't as comfortable as they are now and weren't as safe. And uh, we appreciate all that service and appreciate you taking time to come down here and basically visit with us a little bit about uh, about your time. And well, the fire department really changed. Yeah. I wore a hearing aid on kind of a defroster. They didn't have them. Right. A lot of noise, a lot of hazards that, you know, not not yeah. as much uh, protective gear wasn't as good. good. You know, yeah. air packs. No, no mask. Mm -hmm. Only one that had a mask was a chief. Yeah. And his driver could wear it to go in and tell us what we were doing and second alarms and everything. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, nowadays you wouldn't even think about entering a building without one. And I mean, thank goodness, but, but at the same time, you guys breathe who knows what. Yeah. You know, when when something's on fire, it doesn't just burn the wood. It burns all the insulation and the wiring and, you know, the chemical ingestion that we we don't even know what y'all breathe, all of it. But it's a wonder, you know, a guy gets to be 95 years old. You're 95, is that right? Yeah. So what do you think, what do you think just before, as we close out here, we got to get moving on, but... As you close out your uh, your little interview here, what do you think? What do you attribute your long life to? You think you just got good genetics, or have you done anything special? Or well, my mother lived till she was 97. Okay. My dad died when he was 63. Mm-hmm. And he was probably did he smoke? Yeah. Uh, well, he smoked a pipe, but okay. He, he would he actually smoke matches because he huh. he wouldn't keep puffing long enough to burn up the tobacco. <laughs> Couldn't keep it lit. Had to go back with a match all the time. But well, that's interesting. I always wonder when somebody lives to be that age. I've got some relatives in my family that lived well into their 90s and and bordering 100. And and I'm just always kind of curious as to what I think I've got it identified in my family as genetics. And the one, the one ingredient was the people in my life, my, my dad, for example, who was a, a lifetime smoker. I mean, it obviously made a difference. Um, 
And then his brother, my dad died at 78, and his brother died at 98. Brother had smoked a little when he was younger, but he quit way back there. And so I th I've identified, I think, is for me and my family, the genetics are there if you don't smoke, seems like. So anyway, just yeah, interesting. I've got a sister who's 98. Yeah, 98. So you got some genetics. Your family's long lived. My looks older like. sister was 92 when she died. Wow. And my middle sister, she wasn't in her 90s. She must have been 80. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'll come along after all of them. Right. I'm the baby of the family. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, Leroy, we appreciate you coming out. Oh. Thank you for your. Oh, did you, we. Uh, uh, my fire department name is Spud. Spud. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, uh, Andy Miller, when I first went to work. Yeah. Well, they shipped me down to headquarters for a day, and uh, they they help. I was in the kitchen as a helper. And we had three tables, mm -hmm. and the headquarters had three, uh, three rigs in it. And so we had six, six foot tables. Okay. And after we got through eating, well, I was getting ready to do the dishes. Well, I'd go around to each table, and it had potatoes in it, and I'd finish off the potatoes. <laughs> and in the middle, said, hey, Spud. I turned around and looked. That's the first time he hollered that. Yeah. I said, "Who are you talking to?" It was only me and him in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how those firehouse nicknames get started. Yeah. That's... There's a bunch of them out there. I've got a friend that they used to kid him. They said he called him Blister. Said he showed up when the work was done after the work was done so he called him blister i mean it's just amazing some of the mm -hmm. got another buddy of mine so retired uh, lawton firefighter and they called him pawpaw because he was always kind of an old soul you know and i <laughs> guess he he was older than a lot of the young guys so they started calling him pawpaw so it's just funny how all that but well spud we appreciate you coming mm -hmm. down and uh, mm -hmm. leroy spud harding ladies and gentlemen we appreciate your time appreciate your your stories and and your your uh you look back into the old days of firefighting and it's always interesting and for this uh for this episode of the firehouse chronicles we're glad you made it we'll see you next time thank you